there, welcome to That Dang Dad, my name is Phil, and tonight I want to talk about two philosophical theories that are ruining your life. If they aren't ruining your life, you might actually be benefiting from them. Either way, I want to shine a light on them so you'll recognize them when you see them, and hopefully, so we can all do our part to push back on them. The conversation tonight will dance around concepts like poverty, violence, and depression, but I don't expect to get very graphic. Still, if you're looking for a lighthearted little romp, well, I guess you shouldn't have clicked on a video that promised to talk about your life being ruined. But now's your chance to bail. Alright, let's get started. Has anyone ever excitedly told you, or have you ever excitedly told someone else, about how Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos became some of the richest people on the planet after starting their companies in a garage? Have you ever wondered why CEO pay is hundreds of times higher than the average employee salary at many companies? And why even executives who helm failing companies seem to end up back in the C-suite or on boards of directors somewhere? Does it ever bother you that some guy you didn't care about five years ago is suddenly the frontrunner for a political party in the most important election of our lifetimes, and we must all admire and rally around them to save us from the evils of the other party? I believe that these phenomena are some of the consequences that emerge from great man theory. This idea has roots all the way back to 1840 when Scottish philosopher Thomas Carlyle wrote the following. Universal history, the history of what man has accomplished in this world, is at bottom the history of the great men who have worked here. They were the leaders of men, these great ones. The modelers, patterns, and in a wide sense, creators of whatsoever the general mass of man contrived to do or to attain. All things that we see standing accomplished in the world are properly the outer material result, the practical realization and embodiment of thoughts that dwelt in the great men sent into the world. The soul of the whole world's history, it may justly be considered, were the history of these. One comfort is that great men, taken up in any way, are profitable company. We cannot look however imperfectly upon a great man without gaining something by him. He is the living light fountain, which it is good and pleasant to be near. The light which enlightens, which has enlightened the darkness of the world. And this, not as a kindled lamp only, but rather as a natural luminary shining by the gift of heaven. A flowing light fountain, as I say, of native, original insight of manhood and heroic nobleness, in whose radiance all souls feel that it is well with them. Great man theory supposes that history is the story of what really smart, courageous, driven individuals have done to change society. Think about how we talk about figures like Emperor Constantine, Genghis Khan, the Prophet Muhammad, Charlemagne, Napoleon, George Washington, Hitler, Reagan, or Martin Luther King Jr. These are individuals who made individual decisions that changed the course of history. Great man theory speculates that some people are born with innate qualities or talents that make them ideal candidates for changing the world. The masses can go to school and work a trade and attain varying levels of success, but only a precious few people are born with the natural gifts that make them great. Now. I'm not a historian, so perhaps fittingly, don't take me as an authority on this, but I don't think the great man theory of history holds a ton of value. For one, I think that, like the biblical prophecy craze that swept the churches of my youth, it really only works in retrospect. Sitting in the future, we look backwards at the past and construct a story full of main characters and pivotal decisions. It has no predictive value. Will Baron Trump emerge as a great man, Greta Thunberg, Malia Obama, Maria Putina, Steve Sticky Debicki from Dayton, Ohio? Who knows? For another thing, plenty of so-called natural-born leaders have lived and died without ever becoming the face of a revolution. For every Rosa Parks, there were 50 unremembered black activists getting Salisbury steak dumped on their heads during lunch sit-ins. For every King Leonidas, there were a hundred ragtag army squads who just got absolutely curb stomped by a larger army. For every Elon Musk, there's a thousand colonizer fail sons who vanish into the mists of history with pockets full of stolen wealth. On the one hand, it's understandable that we choose to engage with history this way. History remembers powerful people, 
and powerful people influence the way their history is written. So it's no surprise that it's just easier to think about history in terms of kings, queens, generals, and religious leaders. We don't know what some wagon driver named William Robert Cobblestone thought about King George III's taxation policies, but we damn sure know what John Adams and Thomas Jefferson thought about it. On the other hand, this almost completely overshadows the people of history who died in the wars, whose countries were colonized, who were enslaved, persecuted, or burned at the stake. Have you ever heard someone say of slavers like George Washington or Thomas Jefferson, Well, it was a different time back then. People didn't really know slavery was wrong. Like, I'm pretty sure Sally Hemings and Ona Judge knew slavery was wrong. But they weren't great men, so their stories don't count. When you only think about history in terms of influential figures, you miss many of the real material conditions faced by everyday people, which may influence how much empathy you feel for them. Even worse, when we engage with history via great men, sometimes we wind up structuring our present around them too. Big business is obsessed with the idea of finding rock stars, talented A players that determine the fate of companies. There's this sense, especially in the tech sector and in creative fields, that there's a few geniuses out there who know how to make the big money, and it's everyone else's job to support them until they lay the big brain egg or whatever. This means that companies often give all the attention and mentoring to the rock stars and neglect the lesser mortals on the team, which often creates a feedback loop where the non-rock stars fall behind, causing them to be less invested in, causing them to fall further behind. And think of how many film directors, producers, and actors have been allowed to sexually abuse people around them or treat production crew members like lowly servants. Think of how many high-level executives in companies all over the world have been allowed to do the same. Then, think of how when some up-and-comer actually experiences a single consequence for one of their abuses, you always see certain people hand-wringing about how it's a shame these indiscretions are depriving the world of his important work. These same people never seem to wonder about all the works of genius that never came to be because marginalized people were abused out of the industry by untouchable rock stars. The great man myth is an excuse to value some lives over others, a post hoc rationalization for investing a lot in a few and ignoring the rest, or worse. As we'll see in the next chapter, though, this theory isn't the only one that helps us devalue other lives. I want to begin this section with a little thought exercise. I want you to think of something fun you bought for yourself recently. It can be anything, big or small. A new video game in the Steam Summer Sale, a bottle of wine, a new movie rental, a pizza from your favorite local joint, a new book, a new car, a new house. Have you got one? Good. Let me ask you this. Did you deserve it? Did you trade your time or your labor for the money you used to buy that thing? Or maybe you don't have a lot of money, but you got this thing as a gift. Were you a good friend, a good family member to the person who gave it to you? I guess what I'm asking is, have you lived your life in such a way that acquiring this thing is the positive result of positive behavior? For the most part, I think a lot of us would look at the things we've bought and we'd say, yeah, you know what? I did work for that money. I woke up early, I showed up on time, I followed the rules and cashed my paycheck and I bought that thing fair and square. I deserve to have it. I think this is a natural and completely understandable thing to think. After all, you probably did trade your time or energy or body in some way in exchange for some of the things that you own. You put in, you got out. That's how life is supposed to work, right? Of course, not everyone has all that you have, even if you live very modestly, very precariously. There's enough tragedy porn on TV and the internet that we can all think of people living with almost nothing living in horrific conditions. Which brings up the same question. Do they deserve it? And you're a good person, you want to answer, of course not, but hold on. Many of them work harder than you. They suffer more than you. They don't make worse choices than you, and they trade much more of their time and energy, much more of their bodies for a fraction of what you have. To put it simply, if you deserve what you have because of the good choices you made, how come some people who also make similar choices have it so bad? There's a couple of ways we can answer this. One answer is that the system is set up to reward certain people over others, and that the structure of our society, intentionally or not, is actually unfairly propping up some and stomping down others. 
But uh, if you're one of the people being propped up, this could be a little damaging to your self-image. So maybe we actually live in a just world and people ultimately get what they deserve. Just work hard, keep your nose clean, follow the rules and you'll be fine. And if you're not fine, well, you probably just didn't work hard enough. You probably broke some rules and you probably just didn't have enough hustle. This philosophy was observed by social psychologist Melvin Lerner in a series of experiments. In a paper with D.T. Miller, he writes, Individuals have a need to believe that they live in a world where people generally get what they deserve. The belief that the world is just enables the individual to confront his physical and social environment as though they were stable and orderly. Without such a belief, it would be difficult for the individual to commit himself to the pursuit of long-range goals or even to the socially regulated behavior of day-to-day -day life. Since the belief that the world is just serves such an important adaptive function for the individual, people are very reluctant to give up this belief, and they can be greatly troubled if they encounter evidence that suggests that the world is not really just or orderly after all. I think this is an important point to consider. I can sit here and frame a just world hypothesis in a way that clearly shows it to be unreasonable, but this philosophy isn't motivated by reason. It's motivated by a human need for the world to make logical sense. After all, if you can't trust the system, if you can't trust the rules, how are you supposed to just drive into work every day and do what you're told and just hope the universe's capricious fuck hammer doesn't randomly smash into you one day? To put it in a simpler way, how could you feel safe driving to the store if you knew that all the traffic lights were just on random timers and unconnected to each other? That just because you have the green doesn't mean everyone else from every other direction doesn't also have the green. We rely on a kind of faith in the system to feel safe in the streets, even knowing that lights could malfunction or drivers could ignore them. We rely on that same kind of faith that if we follow all the laws and guidelines of civic life, that we'll be safe, that we'll prosper, that we'll thrive. Except, millions of people out there have found out the hard way that following all the rules is no guarantee of safety or success. That the system can sometimes just ruin your life and there's nothing you can do about it. Those people are telling us that we're living in a comfortable, intoxicating fiction. That the universe really does have a capricious fuck hammer. That it's really goddamn big. And that it is no respecter of politeness or good karma. Unfortunately, Lerner and Miller's research found that when many of us are confronted with that idea, we choose denial over acceptance. They write, We find a fairly consistent pattern of evidence to indicate that individuals will devalue a victim whom they witness suffering. Some factors, like identification with the victim or remoteness from the victim, may moderate the devaluing effect, but it appears that this effect is generally quite robust. Additionally, they write, if a person who is personally attractive or of high social status is victimized, observers appear to restore their sense of justice not by devaluing the victim, which would be difficult, but by exaggerating the person's behavioral responsibility for his or her fate. Recall my video on how law enforcement taught me to dehumanize people. Media police porn encourages everyone else to do the same. When you see someone hauled away in handcuffs or shot to death in the street, when you see their kids taken away and tossed into the foster system, when you see formerly incarcerated people struggle to find work, when you see addicts pass away in a gutter, when you see the entire carceral system devour your neighbors leaving behind only misery, you have two options. To see these people as humans deserving of dignity, or to see them as deviants deserving of their fate. The latter is so seductive because it's the story we want to believe. Bad behavior results in bad outcomes, and the rest of us know better, act better, are better. If that wasn't the case, it would mean that the system has no safety mechanism to protect the good people from getting ground up. It would mean that the only reason that we ourselves weren't in that same situation was either bias or luck. If it's bias, well, that doesn't make us feel very good. And if it's luck, how confident are we we'll never run out of it? Lerner and Miller put it this way, The justness of others' fates has clear implications for the future of the individual's own fate. If others can suffer unjustly, then the individual must admit to the unsettling prospect that he too could suffer unjustly. The truly uncomfortable element in all of this is that, 
While the wealthy and well-connected have an incentive to glorify the status quo that's making them obscenely wealthy, they don't have to work that hard to convince you that we all get what we deserve. You already want to believe it, because the alternative is terrifying. I wanted to talk about these ideas because I think they're philosophies that can be both largely invisible to the average person and yet extremely impactful on our day-to-day -day lives. We've already talked about how great man theory plays a part in allowing people like Harvey Weinstein to rape his way through Hollywood, or Bill Gates to be both an abusive boss and a medical apartheid serial killer, or even just letting the top salesperson at your company get away with all kinds of scummy behavior. I would argue it also contributes to the quintessential American obsession with the myth of the lone entrepreneur who built his wealth from scratch, and the resulting political system designed to privilege the individual over the collective. Jeff Bezos gets credit for Amazon's billions in profits, but he's not the one peeing in bottles and passing out from heat stroke to load up the trucks. If every Amazon picker walked off the job tomorrow, Amazon would stop functioning. But if Bezos gets lost in space playing Who Has the Bigger Rocket with Richard Branson, Amazon would be fine. He's not a great man. He's just a rich one. Similarly, just world theory is used to cover over a whole host of injustices. State governments all around the United States are trying to make voting more difficult for poor and disabled citizens. However, when their votes are suppressed, they are blamed for being lazy. During the COVID crisis, half the country basically accepted high death rates among the sick and elderly as natural, like it was their fault for being old or disabled. Unarmed black people like George Floyd or Eric Garner are blamed for their own murders at the hands of police for the capital crime of failing to submit fast enough. Even a sleeping EMT like Breonna Taylor gets blamed for dating the wrong guy, as if that justifies her being shot to death by inept LMPD officers. Opioid addicts are criticized for a lack of willpower, homeless people are told to get a job, and Palestinians are blamed for their own ethnic cleansing. Just world theory is being used to lull you and me into inaction when we see suffering. Folks, we gotta do better than that. First, let's stop looking for rock stars, heroes, and saviors. Yeah, leadership is good, but a leader is nothing without an effective team. Companies require the whole collective to work together. Political movements require the whole collective to act in one accord. And our communities require all of us to do our part to elevate the collective so that we can all thrive. This doesn't erase the individual, it empowers the individual to contribute their talents to the group and receive back benefits from other talented people. As the old saying goes, do cool shit for people that need cool shit, and they'll do dope shit for you when you need dope shit. There will always be people with an unusual abundance of energy, or a powerful charisma, or a brain that solves certain problems really well, and it's okay to celebrate that. Let's just stop pretending they're the only people who matter. Finally, and most importantly, we have to grapple with the fact that the world is not predictable, fair, or orderly. Some of us will follow all the rules and still get shit on by the universe. Some of us will make all the right choices and still suffer terribly. We have to stop pretending that it couldn't happen to us, that our obedience and faith in the system protects us, and we have to stop dehumanizing the victims of a cruel world and cruel, human-made systems in order to soothe our own anxieties. Today it's them. Tomorrow it could be you. How would you treat today's unlucky winner if you knew tomorrow was your turn? Folks, tomorrow's coming faster than you want to admit. Let's build a world that meets the needs of the suffering and rejects obvious lies about bootstraps and hustle and personal responsibility. By all means, make healthy choices, but one of the healthiest choices you can make is to aid the afflicted around you. If for no other reason than to make sure that they can help you out when that capricious fuckhammer turns its hungry eyes to you. So what do you think? Am I missing something worthwhile in either of these philosophies? Have you personally been affected by these ideas? Let us know in the comments. Please give this video a like, subscribe if you haven't, but most importantly, please share this video with someone that you think would get something out of it. As for me, I just appreciate you spending time with me tonight, and I hope to catch you on the next one. Good night.